done for us. I thank you for today. I thank you for the beautiful weather. I thank you for a chance to gather in your house. Lord, as we begin a new series, a new study, uh, I just ask that you would give me the right words to speak through this, that you would give people the right, the ears to hear, and that everything that is said and done will bring glory to Christ. And Lord, if there's someone here this morning that does not know you as Savior, I pray that your Holy Spirit would open the eyes of the blind, that they would see their need for salvation that's found in Christ alone. So be with us today as we study your word, and I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Genesis chapter 28, 1 and 2. I have always enjoyed studying the lives of people from the Bible because it reminds me that God uses regular, everyday people, just like you and just like me, to accomplish his will. God does not just use the smartest, the wealthiest, the bravest, and the popular. God uses people who do not have it all together to accomplish his will and to accomplish his plan. In this study, we will discover that God is going to choose a mixed up, messed up family, Joseph's, to be his chosen people. The study of Joseph, of course, takes place in your Old Testament. Now, some people say, why do we have to study the Old Testament? You know, we believe in the New Testament. It, it's true. But the New Testament tells us this about the Old Testament. In Romans chapter 15 and verse 4, the scripture says this, Forever things were written be before the Old Testament, they were written for our learning, that through the patience and comfort of scripture, we might have hope. So we study the Old Testament so that we can learn from it, so that we can grow from it. The study of the Old Testament, the more you know about the Old Testament, the more you'll understand the New Testament. In this study, we're going to learn, you know, where does God's people come from? I mean, one time there wasn't a Jewish people, and then there was. Where do the 12 tribes of Israel, how do they come to pass? What tribe did Jesus come from? Why is that important for you and for me? And so we're going to learn a ton of things in this study, both from the Old Testament and from our New Testament. This study is going to take, Genesis starts, the story of Joseph really kind of gets going in Genesis chapter 37, goes all the way through Genesis chapter 50. So this study is going to take three, four months to go through. So I want you guys to be faithful as you can, because every week kind of builds upon the next. If you miss a week with your vacations and things, listen, go away, have a great time. Just come back, please. And then check out our Facebook page. We'll have all the sermons up there, and you'll be able to just stay right along, even if you get away for a, a little bit. So the next three or four months, get settled in the book of Genesis. We're going to have a great time studying God's word. Whenever you do a study, if you want to take notes, for you note takers, on the back of your bulletin, there's an outline. Whenever you do a study, you have to first start with the background, and that's the first point. When you begin to study a person in the Bible, it's important to understand their background, who they are, where do they come from. Well, when we study the Jewish people, it always starts with a guy named Abraham. In Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, we read this. Now the Lord said to Abram, get out of your country, get from your family, and go get away from your father's house to a land that I will show you, and I will make you a what? Great nation. So up until this point, God has not ha chosen a people. There is no nation of Israel. There are no God's chosen group. So this starts with Abraham. A God goes to Abraham. God looks over the whole world, goes to Abraham and says, hey, I need you to leave your house. I need you to leave your family. You're going to get a new family. You're going to get a new home because I'm going to start a new people, Abraham. And this people is going to start with you. And through you, I'm going to make a great nation. I'm going to call a people unto myself. I'm starting with you. Now, if you got to pick in who you started with, you'd probably pick a good person, right? If you were going to have a group of people to represent you throughout the whole earth, you'd probably choose some perfect family. But here's the great thing about God. God does not choose a perfect family. God chooses mixed up, messed up people, like I talked about, to accomplish his will. And we're going to discover, even with Abraham, he's got a mixed and messed up life. But to become a great nation, Abraham has to have some kids. And he doesn't have any kids at this point. And so God is going to bless Abraham with a son named Isaac. In Genesis chapter 21, 2 and 3, For Sarah conceived and bore Abraham a son in his old age, and Abraham called the name of his son who was born unto him, whom Sarah bore Isaac. And so Abraham is the start, really, of the Jewish people. Abraham has a son named Isaac. 
they are important, but we're not going to be spending a ton of time with Abraham and Isaac in our study of Joseph. So Abraham gets called, Abraham has Isaac. Isaac then is going to have a son, and his name is Jacob. Now Jacob, here's the deal, Jacob is very important to our study. And the reason Jacob is so important is Jacob is going to become the father of Joseph. And not only will he be the father of Joseph, Jacob is also going to have 11 other sons. And so Jacob is going to have Joseph. He's going to have 11 other sons. He's going to have 12 sons in all. These 12 sons will basically become the 12 tribes of Israel. And so Jacob will have Joseph. That's going to happen. He's going to have Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Dan, Naphtali, Gad, Asher, Issachar, Zebulun, and Benjamin. What a weird bunch of names, huh? But does anyone know, just out of curiosity, what tribe Jesus comes from? Jesus will come from the tribe of Judah. That'll be important as we go on. So we're going to have to get to know Jacob a little bit because Jacob is going to have Joseph. Jacob is the start, really, of the, of the 12 tribes. So Abraham has Isaac. Isaac has Jacob. Jacob's going to have a bunch of sons that become the 12 tribes. You got it so far? All right, not too hard. So how does this happen? At this point in our study, in Genesis chapter 28, Jacob has no children. And his dad, Isaac, is looking around going, I want some grandkids. And so he's going to send his son, in Genesis 28, Jacob is going to send, or Isaac's going to send Jacob to go find a wife. Because he wants some kids. Plus, they need to carry on the family name because through them will come a great nation. In Genesis chapter 28, we start in verses 1 and 2. Then Isaac, that's the dad, called Jacob, that's the father who's going to have Joseph in the 12 tribes, and he blessed him, and he charged him and said, you shall not take a wife from the daughters of Canaan. Arise, go to Padan Aram, to the house of Bethuel, your mother's father, and take for yourself a wife there from the daughters of Laban, your mother's brother. Jacob not married, Jacob has no kids, his dad wants him to get married, but he doesn't want him to marry a Canaanite. He's looking around, he's in the promised land, and there's a bunch of foreigners, there's a bunch of Canaanites and Amalekites and theseites and thatites. And he's worried that his son is going to marry a pagan. After all, if there's all pagan women around and there's no other believers around, what does he really have to choose from? So his dad says, listen, no, 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 you're not going to be marrying a pagan. You're not marrying a Canaanite. So what I need you to do is I need you to go back to the homeland. I need you to get back into our family, and I need you to find a believer in Jehovah. I don't want you marrying an unbeliever. Finding a good wife was important back then, and let me say without doubt, finding a good wife is just as important today. And the Bible teaches without doubt, with clarity, that a believer should marry another believer. The Bible says that we are not to be unequally yoked with unbelievers. Now, here, here's the deal. Just be, if you may be married to someone who's not a believer, and in no way, shape, or form does God want you to divorce that person or leave that person. That's not anywhere close to what the Bible teaches. God says, what man has joined together, let no man separate. But if you're married to an unbeliever, it doesn't mean that they're not a good spouse. It doesn't mean that they don't love you. It doesn't mean that they don't love your kids. Someone can be an unbeliever and be a good husband. Someone can be an unbeliever and be a good wife. But what that person can't be, listen, if you're an unbeliever, you can be a good husband, but you can't be a godly husband. You can't. Because how can you love your wife as Christ loved the church if you don't know Christ? You may, your wife may not know the Lord. She may be a good wife and she may be a good mother, but no matter how she tries, she can't be a godly one because how can she submit to her husband as unto the Lord if she don't know the Lord? And so the Bible isn't saying like that they think that God says, well, they're not going to be a good spouse. No, God wants you to have a godly marriage. And I'm here to tell you, it's a lot easier when people are on the same page. I'll just give you, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but I'll just say it really quick. When Darcy and I got married, Darcy was a believer, I was an unbeliever. And I'm here to tell you, it was hard. I'm here to tell you, we had two different ideas of what we wanted to do and how we wanted to live and what was going to be our main focus. And I thank God that he was gracious enough and he saved me and he changed my life and he changed my marriage. 
you say, well, it worked out for you, it'll work out for me. I don't know. Hope it does. Is that what you want to risk? Or do you want to marry someone, for those of you who aren't married, marry someone who will pray with you, marry someone who will raise your kids up in the things of Jesus, marry someone who will, who will be glad when they say, let's go to the house of, of the Lord. If you're married to an unbeliever, I, I say this, be a light and a godly example to that person because I'm a testimony that God can reach down and save them and change their life. So he wants his wife, he wants, excuse me, Jacob wa wants him to find a, a, a godly wife. Isaac wants Jacob to find a godly wife. There's no, you know, there's no e-harmony. There's no ChristianSingles.com. They're not meeting online. He's looking around and going, I got no one for you. Go back home. Find a believer. And so Jacob, what he does is this. He goes back home, and he meets an amazing woman. I mean, he, go back, he goes back home, and he finds the love of his life, and it is a lady named Rachel. She is pretty. That's another word. She is hot. She's, the, she's what he has been looking for. This was a woohoo moment, man. He's like, this is going to be good. So Jacob meets Rachel, and he goes, hey, goes up to her dad. And is like, I want to marry her. In Genesis chapter 29, verses 16 through 20, we read this. And Laban had two daughters. The name of the eldest one was Leah. That's the older one of this home. And the name of the younger was... Oh, yeah, Rachel. Leah was tender-eyed, hmm. but Rachel was beautiful and well-loved, well-favored. And Jacob loved who? Rachel. And he said, I will serve you seven years for Rachel, your younger daughter. And Jacob served seven years for Rachel. And here's where you go, oh, this is so romantic. And they seemed but a few days for he, the love that he had for her. Aw, uh, it isn't all. That's a Hallmark card waiting to happen, isn't it? So this guy Laban, he has two daughters. The older one is Leah. The Bible says she is tender-eyed. I just think it means she was ugly. I'm not saying that's what it says. Don't come back to me later, but I, I think that's God's way of going. And she was eh, tender-eyed. I don't know if she had an eye problem. I don't know if you had a squint to look at her it was that bad. I don't know what the answer is. But she's the oldest, and no one's married her. You know what I'm saying? And so eh, we'll just go with ugly. And so Le Leah was tender-eyed. Rachel, on the other here's the contrast, because it was like she was tender-eyed, but Rachel was beautiful, well-favored. She was the model. She was just all the way around, and, and, and man, she was just hot. And so, so Jacob wants to marry her so bad. Jacob goes, you know what, Laban, give me your youngest daughter. I will work how many years to marry her? Seven and they were but a few days for the love that he had for her. Man, that's making us guys look bad. Darcy's like, can you take five minutes and take out the trash? I'm like, oh, five minutes. He's got five minutes to take out the trash and do that, man. And this guy's like, I'm busting out seven years. Every day he went to work thinking, I'll work hard because I'm going to marry Rachel. I love her. I mean, in those seven years, man, it just felt like this. Because you know what he was thinking about all seven years? Yeah, you know what he was thinking about all seven years marrying this lady. So the seven years are up, and it comes to pass for the wedding night. And this is real exciting for Jacob. He's doing seven years. You got to picture it. But the dad, instead of giving Rachel to Jacob, he slips Leah into the tent. And in Genesis chapter 29, verse 25, it says this. So it came to pass in the morning that behold, this is just funny, that behold, it was Leah. And he said to Laban, what is this you have done to me? Was it not Rachel that I served you? Why then have you deceived me? You know, you read that and some people immediately question, how could you not know it was Rachel, right? Is that what you're thinking? How could you not know? You're thinking, I'd have known. Well, keep in mind a couple things. In Bible times, they did not have 100 watt light bulbs like you got, all right? And someone's like, well, if he couldn't see her, how could he, you know, maybe, how could he not know her voice? Maybe they weren't talking. You ever think about that either? I mean, the guy's been waiting, what, seven years. I mean, he's ready to get married, and this is wedding, and they're in the tent, and there's no light, and it's this great night. And, you know, he's ready to go. Seven years of hard work. The Bible says joy comes in the morning. Not in this case, my friend. <laughs> he 
man, the sun came up, and behold, it was Leah, the tender-eyed one. Dude, that's wrong. I don't care when you lived. I don't care if it was in Bible times or now. That ain't right. So the dad pulled the old switcheroo on, 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 on him. He slipped in the tender-eyed one, and the morning came. He's like, I got the wrong wife. And he, and he goes to him. He's enraged. Why have you deceived me? Why ha- have you done this? Why this and why that? And, and, and then the dad, you got to love this guy. you got to love Laban. He goes this to Jacob. He goes, I'll tell you what. You still like Rachel? You can have her. But you got to work another seven years. Dude, that's wrong, man. Genesis chapter 29, 27 through 28. This is what he says there. Finish this daughter's bridal week. Then I will give you the younger one also in return for another seven years of work. And Jacob did so. And then Laban gave him his daughter, Rachel, to be his wife. You notice what it doesn't say there? That it didn't feel like a few days anymore, did it? Has no more. All that romantic stuff is gone down out the window. This next seven years is not like those first seven years. Every day he labors and every day he goes home to tender eyed. Every day he walks back and that's his wife. Every day for seven more years, man, he sees, he sees Rachel over there, the woman that he loves and the woman that he wants. Fourteen years this guy works to marry the woman that he loves. That's messed up. That's messed up. So now at this point, uh, we have Abraham, we have Isaac, we have, we have Jacob, and now Jacob has two wives. We have Tenderide and we have Rachel. He's married to one life, wife that he does not want, does not like, did not want to be with, and now he's married with one that he has loved and that he really wanted to be with. And so look what happens in Genesis chapter 29 and verse 31. And when the lo- Lord saw that Leah was hated, he opened up her room, womb, but Rachel was barren. See, all ki- kids in Bible times like say they're, they're important. After all, if there's going to be a great nation, there's going to be some kids involved in this. And so God looks down, and he loves Leah. He cares about Leah. He made Leah the way she, but, but it, so he saw that she was hated. So what he does, he says, Leah's going to start having some kids, but Rachel is not. Well, all of a sudden, this is not going well in this home. Rachel gets mad that Leah is now having all the kids. Rachel's trying, but they can't have any kids. So what Rachel does is this. Rachel decides, you know what? Since I can't have kids, I'm going to give you my handmaided Bilhah. And Jacob's like, all right, sounds like a plan. And so now he's married to two women, Leah, tender-eyed, Rachel, the one he loves. Rachel can't have kids, so she gives her 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 helper, Bilhah. And so Bilhah starts having kids. Well, Leah's like, oh, you gave her your handmaiden? I'm going to give him my handmaiden. Jacob's like, okay, sounds good to me. And so all of a sudden, I mean, you know, he, she gives him Zilpah. So we're going to read about Bilhah and Zilpah and all these people. So here's it is. Jacob is now married to two women, one he didn't want, one he loved. He now has two handmaidens from these two women. And at this point in the story, he has a bunch of, it's like a baby contest, man. Kids are just popping out everywhere. That's probably why he's just like, name them anything. Zaphonara, Zaphira, who cares at this point? And so he's naming all these kids. He's got 11 of them here. And he, the, he, he now has four women that he, he's engaged with and sleeping with here. That he has 11 sons, and he has not one from the woman that he loves. He has not one from Rachel. You can imagine. You're thinking, are you starting to think, like, why did God choose this family? I'm feeling better about my family. How about you? I'm like, yeah, we're not so bad now. <laughs> we're, we're all right. We're half normal here. And so God then looks down upon Rachel, and this is what we read in Genesis chapter 30, 20 through, 22 through 24. Then the Lord remembered Rachel, and God listened to her and opened up her womb, and she conceived and bare a son, and so she called his name what? Joseph. And so now you got Abraham, you got Isaac, you got Jacob. Jacob married tender eyes and Rachel. Then they got a couple handmaidens involved. He has these 11 other sons, but one son from the woman that he loves. And what is that son's name? Joseph. Go ahead and flip it forward. We're going to go ahead 17 years in Genesis chapter 37. So go, let's look at the bad report. Now, while you're turning there, you say, why did you take us through that whole mixed up, messed up family, man? That's kind of weird to begin this study with. Because I, I need you to understand, to understand Joseph, you need to understand what this family is like. 
You need to understand how there's envy, there's jealousy, there's bitterness, and there's hatred. This is a mixed up, messed up family that has all come together, and you're going to see a lot of hatred brewing in here. Can you imagine why? You have four women. You have all these different people. You have one that you love, the other that you don't like, some that you took because they were handmaidens. There's kids everywhere, and what you have in this home is basically a boiling pot that eventually is going to bust over. Seventeen years go by, and we read in Genesis chapter 37 and verses 1 and 2. Now Jacob dwelled in the land where his father was a stranger, the land of Canaan. And this is the history of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was feeding his flock with his brothers. The lad was with some of the sons of Bilhah, which was the handmaiden, right? And Zilpah, his father's wives, and Joseph brought a bad report to them, or th of them to his father. Joseph's now 17, and he is put in a very difficult situation. His dad sends him out as a spy on the rest of the kids. These guys are shepherds, and the, as being a shepherd, there's a lot of downtime, there's a lot of free time. And so his dad must go to Joseph and say, I need you to go and tell me what's going on with your brothers there. And so Joseph has been placed as kind of the spy in the family. There's a spy in every family, isn't there? I hate things. I, I hate tattletales. I, and the reason I hate tattletales is because I was the, always the one that got tattled on. We'd run into the house, and my sister Kim or Chris, Jared, hey, do you know what Joe did? Do you know what Joe did? And I'd run in. I'd be like, but do you know what they did? Do you know what they did? Anyone else have kids like that? Or, and my parents would all say, say same. No one likes a tattletale. No one likes tattletale. I don't like tattletales at home. I didn't like them in school. There was this guy. I don't hold grudges, but his name was Joel Duckett, in case he's watching. <laughs> We're in like sixth grade. And I remember the teacher saying, who made that funny noise in class? And he pointed over at someone, not me probably, but it was me. Who wrote on the blackboard? It was always me. Joel Duckett was just a tattletale. So you know what we did? We beat the tar out of him in recess one day. <laughs> you say, that ain't godly. Yeah, but he stopped tattletaling. You know, see, here's the deal. It doesn't matter if it's in the home. It doesn't matter if it's in the schoolyard. It doesn't matter if it's in a max security prison. Uh, snitches get stitches. That's how we roll back in my day, man. So just so you know, don't be talking about people behind their back. And so Joseph goes back, and he gives this bad report, and my dad did this, and my dad did that, and he's the baby of the family. And you, any of you here, the youngest in your family, yeah, it's like you guys can do nothing wrong. The parents are stricter with the ones before you. You guys get away with murder. No, nothing ever. You never do anything wrong. Everything's just, oh, they're the baby of the family. I see all the older people going, yeah. Didn't, yeah, that's how it was. That's how it is. That's how it is. It, 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 in by, at, least, at least in our family, you know, at least the youngest used to get the hand-me-down hand clothes, right? That doesn't even happen here. Joseph doesn't even get the hand-me-down clothes. Notice the bias in chapter 37, verses 3 and 4. Now, Israel, I want to stop right there for a second. In Genesis chapter 37 and verse 1, he is called Jacob. God then changes his name to Israel. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, slash Israel as Joseph. You say, why does God change people's names? I don't know. Ask him. Maybe it's just to confuse us. I have no idea. But he's changed his name to Israel now. So I will still mess up and call him Jacob sometimes, and he'll still be referred to Jacob. But Jacob and Israel are the same person. After all, it, it, God's chosen people is the nation of Israel. So back to chapter, thir uh, chapter 37. Now, Israel loved Joseph more than all his children because he was the son of his old age. Also, he made him a tunic or a coat of many colors. But when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, what's the next two words? They hated him, and they could not speak peaceably with him. One of the greatest mistakes you can make as a parent is to show favoritism over one child to another. Now, you may have more in common with one child. Maybe your child likes sports, and you like sports, and so you, you have a lot in common with that kid, your child. 
Maybe one of your child likes academics and likes to read, but you're not really into that a, as much. And you need to be careful, parent, that you don't take the child that you have more in common with and give them more or spend more time with them. You are to treat all of your children favorably. You're to love them all. You're to treat all of them equally. That is very important in a household, especially if it is a mixed household with different families and maybe different moms and different dads. All children are a gift from God, and if God has placed them under your home, I don't care if it, they have different mothers or different dads, all of those children, if you are engaged in that and that is your family, you treat them all the same. They've all been placed under your care. They're all your family. They're all your sons. They're all your daughters. If you married into that, those are your kids, and you treat them all exactly the same because they are all gifts from God, and they are all placed under, under your care. Well, Joseph, what has happened here is Israel obviously loves Joseph more than all the other kids. And to show this, he makes him a coat of many colors, just him, just like that one. Can you imagine this? Pretend you have a bunch of kids. You have a bunch of kids, and Christmas morning comes. And then one kid has this big old pile of toys. And it's like, I got, I, got, I got a pile of toys, I got video games, I got a new bike, I got a puppy, I got a shirt that says, Dad loves me over here. And then the other kids open their presents, and they have underwear. That's it. They just got some underwears. That's all they got. It would be obvious which child that you love the most. This kid got a pony and a shirt and video games, and you're sitting there with some Fruit of the Loom, man. That's all you got? How happy of a Christmas morning would be that for everyone else? So what has happened is jo or here, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob has showed favoritism, loving Joseph, makes him a coat, cares about him. And what he does I is this. He creates a jealousy in, in, in the home. Their dad showed favoritism. I want you to know something. It was their dad that showed favoritism. But who did they hate? Joseph. It doesn't say they hate their dad. It says they hated Joseph. They hated Joseph because he was the favorite. And the Bible says they hate him because they, his dad made him a coat. And it says that they could not speak peaceably with him. That, that's a calm translation. It should say they fought all of the time. Every time they taught, there was an argument and a fight. This home was filled with the kids from many different marriages, from many different places, from different people, with favoritism, with hatred, and with arguing, and with fighting, and with yelling. There couldn't even be a conversation, because every time Joseph opened their mouth, the Bible says they hated him, and they argued with him. And you know who I blame? I blame the dad. I blame the dad. Now, I know in everyone's family, if you've got kids, there's going to be some arguing and fighting along the way, correct? Correct. There's going to be some times where you got to, like, you're the referee, and you have to break them up before there's some blood being spilled here. And, and you go to your rooms, just sep go to your corners and just separate them there. And so I'm not trying to crack on this regular, normal stuff that happens in families. Don't think you're a failure if your kids fight, or none of us would be successful parents. But if there's hatred in your home, if there's bitterness in your home, if there's arguing and fighting constantly between your kids, and you think, that the parents need to look at what type, of, what type of atmosphere have you set in your home. Because if there's arguing and fighting all the time, if there's hatred and envy, if there's no one ever gets along and there's always complications, something is wrong with the direction that the parents have set, and you need to look at your home and say, what have I done wrong that created this environment? Not the normal stuff that happens. I'm talking about it's always a mess, and it's always bad. Something needs to change with the parent. Somewhere along the line, you did not create a home where nurture and love is, is, to, is to be found. It's not too late. You looked it over, changed some stuff. So this is what has happened. He's created an environment, and it is the dad's fault. Notice the bowing down, chapter 37, 5 through 10. So now we have they hate him. Verses 5 through 10, we read this of chapter 37. Now Joseph had a dream, and he told it to his brothers. And they what? Hated him. Next two words. Even more. So he said to them, please hear the dream which I dreamed. There we were, binding sheaves in the field, and behold, my sheaf arose and stood up upright. And indeed, your sheaf stood all around, and it bowed down to mine. And his brother said to him, shall you indeed reign over us, or shall you indeed have dominion over us? And they what? Hated him even more for the dreams and for his words. 
Then he dreamed still another dream and told it to his brothers and said, look, I have dreamed another dream. And this time the sun and the moon and the 11 stars, they bow down to me. So he told it to his father and his brothers. And his father rebuked him and said, what is this dream that you have dreamed? Shall your mother and I and your brothers indeed come and bow down to the earth before you? You know, sometimes if you have a freaky dream, my advice is just keep it to yourself. Okay, that, that's my advice to yourself. That, that's my advice. Now, God gave Joseph this dream. This is a, two prophetic dreams. These are, these are going to be prophecies that come true. God gave them to Joseph. You know who they probably should have stayed with? Joseph. Probably shouldn't have told them. But when you're 17, you don't always have the best discernment in the world. Maybe Joseph is just a 17-year-old kid and don't realize how much they hate him. Maybe he doesn't realize that his coat was a big blinking sign that says, Dad loves me and, and not you. So Joseph has a dream. He's excited about it. He goes, hey, I had a dream. And basically in this dream, we're all working in the field. My, my thing of hay rose up and all yours bowed down. And they hated him even more. See, if you're the older brother, you don't ever want to have to submit to your younger brother. <laughs> I don't want my younger brother coming in and telling me what to do all the time. No, 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 no. Older brothers do not like to lose to younger brothers. Any of you guys have brothers around? You know, you, maybe you have some in your home, and you ever see a basketball game with brothers? Oh, that's tough, man. At my last church, there was this guy named uh, Brian Dahmer. Great guy, him and Marie. Uh, lovely members of our church. We're still friends with them. Um, Brian uh, is a godly man. He is a professional businessman, and he just has a great family. Brian has, I believe it's four uh, uh, other brothers, and Brian is the oldest. Brian told me a story one time that him and his brothers were having a contest of who could hold their breath the longest in an Olympic-sized swimming pool. So what they would do is they would start at the beginning, they would kick off, and they would swim as far as they could under the pool, and then when they couldn't hold their breath anymore, they would come up and they would stand there, and then the next brother would try. Well, Brian had a couple brothers go, and they, they're all very good, very athletic, and then it was Brian's turn. He didn't go last, so he went, and he passed all the other brothers. And he popped out of that, that pool, very proud, stood right there. But then his younger brother went, and his younger brother held his breath longer, and he passed Brian by like 10 feet. And so Brian decided this. He stood up, got out of the pool, and said, I am going again. And so Brian got all the way to the side of the pool, kicked off again, and you know what happened? He swam even farther, further than his, la his youngest brother, but he became unconscious under the water and passed out. His brothers had to run in the pool, jump in the pool, get to Brian, drag him out of the pool, and resuscitate him on the side of the pool. Now, Brian wakes up, sees everyone standing around him, and this is what he says, did I win? This is a godly, professional guy who loves the Lord, loves his kids, loves his family. But there was no way on God's green earth he was letting his younger brother hold his breath longer than him because that's obviously very important in families. But the point is this. You don't want to lose to your younger brother. Man, so they hate him more. Then he goes to his dad. His dad's like, hey, listen, you know what? You're going to bow down to me. And there's the sun and the moon and the stars. And his dad even gets a little mad. Because, listen, I don't want to lose anything to my sons. If I was to go out there and now play basketball with my sons, they are better than me, they are faster than me, and they are younger than me. But I'm not losing. You say, how are you going to lose? I don't know. I'll figure it out on the court. I may break a leg. I may get hurt. But I'm not losing to them. There's just something about I'm the dad, and I'm supposed to win these things. So this is, the, this is the attitude they have. Now, the dad gets mad at them. Everyone hates them. And here, Joseph is just kind of this kid going, I don't know what I did. But notice what happens finally. Notice the bitter envy in verse 11. And his brothers envied him, but his father kept the matter in mind. In verse 4, you may want to underline this. It says they hated him. In verse 8, it says they hated him even more. But then something changes in verse 11. God uses different terminology. What's it say? What did they do? They envied him. Do you know that envy is worse than hatred? The Bible says this about it. In Proverbs 27, verse 4, it says, Wrath is cruel and anger is outrageous, but who is able to stand before envy? See, he here's why. If someone is hated, you don't like them. If someone was envied, 
you wish you were them. You understand the difference between the two there? You wish your dad loves you like Joseph. You wish it was your mother that he wanted to be married with, not the one that he got tricked into fathering your children. You wish your dad gave you the coat of many colors. You wish your dad cared and loved you and accepted you like they did Joseph. You wish God spoke to you in dreams and and had all these great things for you. At the end of this verse, it had passed from hatred to envy. Here's the deal. Envy is worse than hatred. Hatred is what you think about someone else. Envy has to do with what you think about yourself. Hatred is I don't like you. Envy is this. I think so less of myself that I wish I was you. I wish I had what you had and you were who you were and and had the family and the love and the coat and all of those things. Envy is such a dangerous sin because it hurts the self-worth of the person. Joseph's brothers have no self-worth. Their mothers are either handmaidens or a woman that he didn't even want to be married to. There's fighting and hatred and jealousy in this entire family. The dad has made their son Joseph, the wife that he loved, Rachel, made him a coat, favored him. He was the family spy. He was the one that could never do anything wrong. And his brothers sat around, and secretly in their hearts, they said, I wish my dad loved me like Joseph. You can imagine the hatred now, and the jealousy, and the anger that was boiling up in this family. And that's where our story kind of stops for right now. You know, this whole problem starts with showing favoritism. That's the whole problem. That's the sin here. I found this verse in the book of Acts about God, and I think it's important. It's in Acts chapter 10. It says, then Peter began to speak. He said this, I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism. But he accepts men from every nation who fear him and do what what is right. Regardless this morning of your background, regardless of your history, regardless of what you've done, regardless of your nationality, listen, we can all come to know Jesus Christ as Savior. God has promised that he does not a respecter of persons. God does not show favoritism. God does not love me more than he loves you. Listen, when Jesus died on the cross, he loved the whole world the same and gave his life for your sins and mine. If you say, well, I'm not a good person. I'm, not, I'm a bad person. I'm not a church-going person. I'm this or I'm that. God does not show what? Favoritism. You know why? Because it's not about you. It's about God. God's love's not based on how good of a person we are or we're not. God's love is just based on who God is. And if God says, I don't show favoritism, God does not show favoritism. And anyone, the Bible says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Listen, I realize that as we study Joseph, that a lot of this is not going to be salvation messages. We're going to dig deep into God's word. You're going to learn a ton in this study. But know this throughout the whole study. That regardless of how mixed up, messed up you may be, God loves you, Jesus died for you, and if you put your faith and trust in him, he will forgive you of all your sins. Because God does not show favoritism. You know, God does not love me more than he loves you, does not love you more than he loves me. The Bible says in John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. I'm going to ask Nick to come. We're going to have a song of invitation. We're singing one more song here. If you're here this morning and you don't know Jesus, there's never been a time where you trusted him as your savior. What I want you to do this morning is I just want you to step out. I don't care if you're in the balcony. I don't care if you're in the middle aisle or where you're at. I want you to step out and come forward and say, Joe, I don't know, I don't know Christ. I don't know where I'm going to spend eternity. If you're not coming to join at this point, we'll take God's word. We'll show you how to be saved. We'll explain the gospel message. It's simple. Jesus Christ came to earth, lived a perfect and sinless life. He died on the cross for your sins and mine. They buried him in a tomb, and three days later, he rose again from the grave. And one day, he is coming back for his church and for his children. If you've never trusted him as Savior, if God has been working on your heart, I'm asking you to step forward and to come. Maybe God has spoken to your heart about following him in believer's baptism. We already got the water up. Man, we can do it today or next week. It's here. The Bible says in the early church they were saved and then they were baptized. It's a step of obedience. Maybe God's been speaking to your heart about joining Baptist Temple. 
to become part of a local church, to use your gifts and abilities. Or maybe throughout this message, God spoke to your heart in a way that I haven't talked about. Maybe your family's mixed up, messed up. Maybe you've got some anger and bitterness in your family that's been deep down inside. And you could relate to some of the things that were happening in Joseph's life. I want you to know the altar's open. Maybe it's time to lay those things here. To ask God to forgive. And for you to forgive others. I'm going to ask you to stand at this time. If God has spoken to your heart about salvation, would you come? Baptism, would you come? A church membership? Or for one other reason, the altar is always open at Temple. If you just want to come and pray for your family, for the difficulties you may be going through. If God has spoken to your heart this morning, please come.